And the producer of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. During its long and distinguished career on the air, suspense has never taken an editorial stand until now. Now we state unequivocally that this program is against murder. Oh, we play around with the more titillating and entertaining aspects of murder from time to time, but fundamentally, we're against it as a personal, national, or international policy. Only those in favor of murder will find anything objectionable or controversial in the next half hour. The story you are about to hear is but a tiny word of protest. Perhaps it is too little. But please, God, let it not be too late. Listen. Listen, then, as Everett Sloan stars in The Voice of Company A, which begins in just a moment. And now, The Voice of Company A, starring Everett Sloan. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I sat in my lab at Cape Canaveral near the giant missile that would launch our transmitter. I looked at the powerful sending set, knowing that soon we'd toss it into space to scream crazily year after year at a crazy world. We tried to keep the lab quiet, isolated, but in the last few days, the tension of the mess outside had somehow trickled in. I was bushed. Doctor? Yes, Colonel? I think it's coming. Here, read this. Top priority from defense to me. From the Secretary of Defense to Commander Operations Screamer. International situation deteriorating. Commence countdown 0500 Zulu. Midnight, our time. That's right. Is your section ready? Yes, we're ready. Here's the little monster. I just loaded the tape. You want to hear it? Yes. Oh, brother. Yes, when we get all six of these in orbit, you might as well throw away your radio and TV. This is all you'll hear. But this is what we wanted. Uh, turn it off. Okay. Well, I guess we can do without the soap operas if it jams their military frequencies. The soap operas will lose their audience anyway when the ballistic missiles hit. You know, this thing will probably survive us, Colonel. You ever think of that? Screaming away up there when there's nobody left to hear it? It's kind of funny in a way. George, you're tired. Were you in London, Colonel, in World War II? No, Burma. Why? I was in London when the V-2s first hit. Second Louis, Company A, 16th Infantry. I was on a 72-hour pass with some of my guys. We thought the V-2s were the last word, Colonel. A regular bomb you could hear coming. You had somebody to be sore at that last few seconds. Some pilot risked his tail to drop it anyway. Somebody up there hated you. At least you knew that. It wasn't humane, but at least it was human. But a V-2, Colonel, it goes so fast you don't hear it. And there's nobody to hate except some guy sitting at a control panel a couple hundred miles away. And now we've got ICBM. 5,000 miles through space. Oh, yes. We've come a long way. A long way. Uh, yes. Yes. Well, I'll report that we're ready. The colonel looked at me strangely as he left. I knew he thought I was cracking. And maybe he was right. Almost hating to do it, I flicked on the radio, knowing what I'd hear. Under the age of 50, we're called to the colors in France today. Germany has mobilized the reserve components of the new Wehrmacht. Ambassador Lippincott arrived this afternoon at Washington National Airport and said that he saw no hope of averting war. ICBM... I turned it off. Once I thought it could never happen again. Lying in the broken plaster and spilled beer in a London pub with the sergeant's body pinning me down and Pinky yelling for his mother and Botchner groaning in a corner, I knew it could. But it was happening again. And there seemed to be nothing I or anybody else could do to stop it. I turned to the transmitter to unplug it from the test console. That's when I saw him looking at the set. Hey, how did you get... Who are you? Hello, Lieutenant. Or it's Doctor now, ain't it? Botchner. Is it Botchner? Yeah, Lieutenant. It's me, Sad Sack Botchner. But, 
You were killed. You got killed in that pub. Well, in a manner of speaking. No, no, I must be cracking up. No, Lieutenant, relax. I got a message for you is all. Me and Pinky and the Sarge and Pete, we drew cards to see who'd come back. I won. But I don't... So you're gonna toss this thing into space. Yes. And it's got like a tape that plays over and over, follows up the radios all over the world. Yes, except our military frequencies. Now, ain't that clever? Me and Pinky and the Sarge and Pete, we get creamed in that crummy pub in London, and you come out smelling like a rose. And for what? So you can figure out something like this? Now, look, Botchner, it wasn't only me, the Defense Department, yeah, and... The... Yeah, I know. I've been down that road, Lieutenant. Will me and Pinky and the Sarge and Pete figure you ought to put something better than what you got on that tape before it's too late? Something better? Like what? Well, I'll tell you, Lieutenant. Pinky thought it up. Remember, he was always kind of screwy on religion. So he told me, standing gray-faced and floppy as ever in my lab. I knew I was dreaming. I had to be. He told me what to put on the tape. And I laughed. <laughs> what is this, a joke? We don't do much joking, Lieutenant. Mostly we sit around thinking. Ten million guys in different uniforms thinking of the Danes we didn't get to meet and the summer evenings we didn't get to smell and the kids we never got to have. Well, you better do what we say, Lieutenant, because tough as it is at times, it's better here than it is there. We know, Lieutenant. We know. In a moment, we continue with the second act of Suspense. And now, starring Everett Sloan, act two of The Voice of Company A. I sat for a long time wondering if I'd really seen Botchner, wondering if I was losing my mind. And this idea of Pinky, or whosoever it was, it, it was crazy. But I knew suddenly that I had to try it. I had to try it, but I had to move fast. Once the installation crew arrived to pick up the jammer, it'd be too late. There were almost a hundred technicians working in my section. Like any group of Americans, they came from every background. Some, like von Terhoff, were newly naturalized citizens. I buzzed my secretary on the intercom. Yes, Doctor. Uh, get von Terhoff up here right away, Carolyn. And uh, Pierre Duval, he speaks French, doesn't he? And that new technician, Barbara Chang, does she speak Chinese? Yes, I think so. Why? Uh, send her up. Who speaks Russian? Russian? Well, I don't know. Ah, uh, Poznansky. A lot of Poles know Russian. Send him in, too. And, uh, Carolyn. Yes, Doctor. I want to see them one at a time. It was easy with Duval and Poznansky. They accepted my story without a question. But von Terhoff looked at me strangely. I did not know you were a religious man here, Doctor. You say that this is for your minister? Yes, it's just an idea he had for next Sunday's sermon, Ron. If you'll just uh, speak into the mic. Well, it seems to me a strange time to... Well, it'll only take a minute. All right. Okay, ready? Ready. Du sollst dich töten. The pretty Chinese microwave expert was so enthusiastic, I hated myself when I lied to her. I hadn't been to church since World War II. You couldn't matter to his congregation, Doctor, but 
A native Chinese wouldn't understand the religious significance. Well, why not? Well, Confucius put it another way. Well, recite that then. Wun hui jogi, si gogi yeloi, wai go dagao ni, dasi guaga gi. When she left, I held the mic in my hand for a long while. Finally, feeling strangely humble, I recorded the English version myself. When I was through, I spliced the tape into a loop like the jamming tape so that it would repeat over and over. Over and over, year after year. I took the jamming tape out of the transmitter and started to put in my new one. Was I crazy? Then I remembered the twisted bodies in the London pub and Pinky and the Sergeant Pete and, of course, Sad Sack Bachner. They seemed suddenly very close. I finished. The installation crew arrived and took the transmitter away, and soon it was midnight and the countdown began. My launching station was in the blockhouse, but if I got there too soon, I'd have to ground test the screamer and the colonel would learn what was on the tape. And if I didn't get there at all, they might not launch. So I waited and waited, watching through the lab window while the last man left the missile gleaming in the Florida moonlight. It was the longest half hour in my life. They were looking for me now. It was time to go. Running across the sand, I looked up at the missile. There, high in the nose, rode the sphere that carried the jammer. T minus two minutes. Condition red. Had All I cut it too close? As I reached the concrete blockhouse, the missile seemed to be straining at an invisible leash. Vapor from its liquid oxygen was curling about its base. T minus one minute. Hey! 59. Hey, let me in! It's Dr. to breathe! I looked again at the huge rocket. I could hear the pumps beginning to deliver fuel to the nozzle. In less than a minute, a quarter of a million pounds of fiery thrust would blast the area, and I'd shrivel like an ant on a hot coal. Hey! Hey! Dr. Creek, holy cow, now get in here! Where's the colonel? Right here. Where have you been? This thing hasn't been ground tested. Well, it is necessary. It'll transmit. Count down. The procedure says do it. We'll do it. Now move, doctor. But I, I checked it on the console. I tell you, it'll transmit. I want to hear that signal. It'll work, I tell you. Oh, help me, doctor. If you don't get going, I'll stop the launch. Now tune it in. I had to do it. As slowly as I could, I twisted the knobs on the test receiver. 12, 11, 10, 9, 8. What's that? What's going on? The colonel lunged for the panic button that would stop the launch. I grabbed his arm. Let me go. Hold it. Hold that bird. Corporal. Put this man under arrest. He's crazy. Or he's an enemy spy. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill. Who is the enemy, colonel? Who is the enemy? In a moment, we continue with the third act of Suspense. And now, starring Everett Sloan, Act Three of The Voice of Company A. They treated me all right in the detention cell at Cape Canaveral. They gave me a radio, the morning papers, all the coffee I could drink. They sent for a psychiatrist to see if I was crazy. Two men from the FBI questioned me to see if I was a spy. Then I was alone until the guard brought in breakfast. Hey, Doc, what's going on? You tell me. Well, my wife and I, we sit down to eat this morning. We turn on the radio to find out if we ought to be digging a hole somewhere. And this voice comes on saying, Thou shalt not kill. And in all foreign languages. Now, my wife, she thinks it's the end of the world. Well, she may be right. What are they going to do to you? Try me for espionage, they tell me. If they don't figure I'm nuts. Doc? Yes? We don't figure you're nuts. When the guard left, I turned on the radio to hear the worst. And it was the worst. ...and launched a formal protest against what they called U.S. celestial propaganda. From Washington, no word yet on what is intended by the strange screamer satellite, only instructions. Instructions on what to do with its passage jammed tunnel rat frequency during a ballistic missile bombardment. Suddenly, I heard it faintly, blanking out the announcer. I looked at my watch. Yes, that was it. It was due overhead. 
Thou shalt not kill. I switched off the set. I hadn't fully realized the power of our transmitter until that moment. And I hadn't realized the power of the message. A shiver raced up my spine. I felt suddenly that I was not alone. Then I saw him, slouching at the window. Botchner? Hello, Lieutenant. In the guardhouse, huh? Remember when you tossed me in the stockade for being AWOL? Well, this ought to square it. Pinky and the Sarge and Pete and me, we've been watching things. It's working out great. Oh, yeah, just fine. There's an awful lot of people don't want to fight this war, Lieutenant. You ought to see them in Europe and China. Yeah? Don't you fret, Lieutenant. Things are going to turn out all right. You see, Lieutenant, we know. Slowly he disappeared, slowly fading. It was weird. I knew that he only existed in my mind, but as the day wore on and the next day and the next, I wondered if he weren't right. Every four hours, the satellite broke in with that simple message. But in the interval, the radio began to talk of reports of a mutiny in the Hungarian army, a revolution against the Czech regime, small religious revival starting in Germany. The department is mum about what was actually intended in the satellite launch Monday. Results are clear. Iron Curtain countries are busy battling anti-war sentiment. International tension has eased. Ambassador Lippincott flew an hour ago to a hastily planned conference in Geneva. More news after the 9 p.m. passage of the satellite. And the fourth night, the cell door opened for the colonel. Hello, George. Hello, Colonel. Did you bring the firing squad? George, I got a dispatch from defense. Yes? You're to be released. Released? That's right. And we're not launching the rest of the screamers. They decided that the crisis has passed. <laughs> now that the thing's in perfect orbit, they want us to stop them. But we can. I know, I know, George. It's solar power that could broadcast for the next 20 years. 50. Yes. And when it quits, Colonel, maybe we better launch another one. Hmm? Oh, yes. I see what you mean. Uh, George. Yes? One question. We know about Duval and the Chang girl and Poznansky. Who recorded the English? Is that your voice? I thought of the smashed bodies of my men in that London pub. Pinky and the Sarge and Pete and Sad Sack Bunchner. My voice, Colonel? No. Let's just say that's the voice of Company A. Du sollst dich töten. Du sollst dich töten. Will we do the Sigogin Yenoi? Why you go the gun? That is Guagogin. Ye will be. Ye will be. Tu ne tueras point. Tu ne tueras point. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill. Suspense. In which Everett Sloan starred in William N. Robeson's production of The Voice of Company A by Michael Frost. In just a moment, the names of the supporting players and a word about next week's story of suspense. Supporting Everett Sloan in the voice of Company A were Lillian Bayef, John Daner, Barney Phillips, Jack Crucian, and Sam Pierce. Listen. Listen again next week when we return with the diary of Sophonia Winter, starring Mercedes McCambridge. Another tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. CBS Radio Network.